Um, ladies and gentlemen, um, please welcome Taylor Hoffman and her panel. These are medical students that have stories to share with you. So my name is Taylor Hoffman, and I actually did this the Voice of the Patient panel last year, and that was one of the first public um, events that I told my story, so I'll keep it short because it's on YouTube forever. Um, <laughs> but basically, um, when I was 18 months old, I was diagnosed with type 1 diabetes. That was a time where CGMs were not a thing, <laughs> insulin pumps were not a thing. Um, we used archaic little, um, you could like adjust your blood glucose numbers and then it would tell you how much you should bolus and I don't, you guys probably don't even know what that is. Um, but then when I was five years old, I was diagnosed with celiac disease and then when I was almost 13, I was diagnosed with Hashimoto's and then when I was 20, 22, I was diagnosed with rheumatoid arthritis. So I kind of have that, that joke on an Anki card here in med school that is like somebody who has all these problems, what's wrong with them? So all my friends think of me when they see that one. Um, and so it's, really, it's been important to me since I was young to talk about how important it is to listen to patients and the realities of the struggles that they go through because it is a physical, um, it's a physical thing that we go through. However, there's so many complexities to healthcare. And, you know, I would, if I could get my supplies on time and get the quantity that I need when I'm supposed to get it, that would take a huge burden off of me. And I would keep the diabetes if I could just guarantee that everything would go right. Um, so, for this year, we thought that it would be a great idea to have med students who also have some sort of chronic disease to talk about how that has impacted their career choice, but also what it's been like to be a patient and then go through the process of becoming a doctor. So if you guys could introduce yourselves and tell a little bit about your story. Hi, my name is Ariana Toomey. I am a Pathway Scholar student at the University of Arizona College of Medicine, Phoenix, which means that um, the Pathway Scholars program is a program for students who want to be doctors but have experienced greater than average challenges or difficulties in applying to medical school or going through college. Um, regarding my story, when I was 18, I was a student at the University of California, San Diego. I was in my second year, and I was feeling very tired all the time. Um, it lasted for about two weeks and got to the point where I couldn't go to class anymore. I was sleeping 20 hours a day, and when I was awake, I was extremely nauseous. I was vomiting all the time. So after two weeks of this, my roommate said, you need to go to student health. And I said, you're probably right. So one of my roommates walked me to student health. And what should be a 10 minute walk from our dorm took me 30 minutes because I couldn't breathe. Um, and when I got to student health, I saw the large waiting room full of people. And I took a seat, got a ticket to be in line, and then the people who worked at the clinic saw me and they said, oh, come back to triage right now. Uh, they could tell that something was very wrong. By the time the doctor came to see me at Student Health, he also knew that something was very wrong and he immediately called an ambulance and sent me to the ER. When I got to the ER, they had no idea what was going on. Um, they threw around a few things. I had a chest x-ray. They were very worried because my oxygen levels were low. And so they sent me to the ICU. I was in the ICU for two days and eventually they told me that I had type one diabetes. Um, you would think that that would be an easier diagnosis because I was experiencing all of the telltale symptoms, but I was in pretty severe diabetic ketoacidosis at this point, which is a complication of undiagnosed or uh, poorly controlled diabetes. So it, it was quite the journey for me, but um, I was diagnosed, I spent another two or so days in the hospital, and from that point, 
everything changed. I now had a chronic disease to deal with on top of school. I was already having um, a lot of difficulties in school because it was, the diabetes had been building for the, the past few months and it just exploded in, when I was diagnosed. Um, so it was really difficult to, though I was feeling better, manage diabetes on top of school. And I was in school for pre-med studies um, and it's very hard to get into medical school, as I sure you, I'm sure you all know, but that really didn't help. So after graduating, um, I had to take some time and um, do some work before applying to medical school to really make my application uh, at the same level as other people who didn't have to deal with that kind of setback. And that's why I'm really happy I found the U of A Phoenix Pathway Scholar Program because they really understood that just because my GPA wasn't the same as everyone else's or my MCAT score wasn't as great as everyone else's, it doesn't mean that I'm not gonna be a great doctor. I just had a few things setting me back. So I'm very happy to be here. Thank you. Hello. Hi, my name is Nina Cherian. I am a first year medical student at UA Comp. Um, when I was 12, I noticed that I couldn't see very well. I've always been viciously nearsighted in my right eye. That's just the way it is. Um, so I really leaned on my left eye. That was my 2020 eye, 2015 on a good day. I was very proud of it. Um, and in the seventh grade, I realized that I couldn't see the back of the, or from the back of the classroom, I couldn't see the board anymore. And it took, Side note, I really love the stories so far about family members advocating for their, you know, loved ones who are saying something's wrong and people are like, oh, you're stressed or, oh, it's nothing, you know, it's normal. Um, I was having all these vision problems. My optometrist gave me bifocals as a 12-year-old, which is not, I don't know how many 12-year-olds you guys know with bifocals, but the number is small and it didn't really help my situation. And my mom fought tooth and nail to get me to see a specialist, and I was soon diagnosed with um, chronic autoimmune uveitis, which is essentially inflammation in the eye. Um, there's like a big ball of, of clear jelly in your eye, and I had a, a whole mess of cells floating around in there, and I couldn't see. Um, I lost about 80% of vision in my left eye, and since that was my, you know, my good eye, I couldn't really see very much at all. Um, and then treatment started. So treatment was a bit of a tumultuous road. I was put on a newly approved medication called Durazol, which is a steroidal eye drop. And that seemed to work really, really well for a while, but then my eye pressure shot up. And eye pressure, just like blood pressure, or any other kind of pressure shouldn't be too high because bad things can happen. Um, and my doctor was adding medication after medication to try and control my eye pressure, and soon I was at risk for developing glaucoma as a 13-year-old, which is not something that you, you know, you don't want to, you don't, you want to avoid that. Um, so it came to a point where the medications that I was on, they were causing intense fatigue. I wasn't able to walk around. My parents and I, um, I grew up near Seattle. We traveled to UCLA for a second opinion. And we went to Universal Studios because my parents wanted to add some, some fun to the trip. And I couldn't walk around the park because I was so tired from all the medications. So we talked to our physician and we got the second opinion and I ended up having a surgery um, that essentially took out the ball of jelly in my eye and replaced it with just a clear solution. And things were fine for a little bit. I had a flare up the next year and um, knock on wood, everything has been okay. I was cleared of the disease when I was 22 and now I'm 26, so things have been great. Um, I have had to make some lifestyle changes. I have a little baby cataract in my left eye that I'll have to get taken out sooner than most people have cataract surgery. Um, I'm a black belt in karate. That was a huge part of my life for a long time. I used to travel and compete, and I had to give up competing and sparring because it just wasn't safe. Um, but this, I mean, that whole experience is the reason that I, I wanted to become a doctor and go to medical school. I loved hearing Michaela talk about her experiences with Dr. Pasternak because I had the same kind of experiences. My doctor would look at me and he had this model of the eye that he would bring out and show me what was going on and I felt just like the smartest person in the world after I saw him because I knew what was going on. 
And it's very empowering, even as a child, to know what's going on with you when something's not right. Um, so that's why I'm here, and maybe we'll get into details later, but grateful to be able to share with you guys. Thank you. Hello, my name is Kelly Walter. Um, so I was diagnosed with ulcerative colitis when I was 19. Um, ulcerative colitis is a different form of inflammatory bowel disease. Um, and I was a sophomore in college, um, and I started noticing that I was getting tired. Like I was really, I played soccer, so I was exercising all the time, but I just couldn't run as much as I used to. Like I'd get really winded. Um, and my sophomore year of college also happened to be 2020. Um, so this was the beginning of 2020. I noticed myself starting to get really winded all the time. And I made an appointment with the doctor at the end of March. However, as we all know, um, the pandemic hit and that appointment was canceled and I stayed in Boston. My family's in Chicago, so I was living by myself and I just was getting worse. Um, but I was like, there's a lot of other worse things going on in the world than my own health issues. I'm a healthy 19 year old other than this. Um, but finally in May, at the end of May, I woke up one morning and was like, I don't feel well. I had a fever, I was super lightheaded all the time, and I made an appointment with a PCP. And I was, she was like, you can go in and get some blood work, and I was like, they're not going to let me in, I have a fever, and they're all going to think I have COVID. And she's like, you could go in through this back door, like she really set it up for me. And I got some blood work that day, went home, and I got a call at 10.30 that night saying, you're hemoglobin is five, you need to go to the emergency room right now. Um, and so I went to the emergency room, got two blood transfusions, um, felt great. Um, <laughs> um, and yeah, I went and got a colonoscopy and got diagnosed, was put on steroids, um, had some lovely physicians. I, that physician that originally like snuck me into the um, her office to get blood work. Um, she wasn't accepting new patients, but I just told everyone she was my PCP, um, and she kept me on for the time I was in college. Um, and yeah, after two months of steroids, I was put on Remicade. Um, and after a year of that, my insurance company was like, we don't like Remicade, you're gonna go on Inflectra, which is the same drug, just a different company. Um, but I do know all of the biologics, so I really appreciate the um, biotech that went into developing those. Um, but yeah. Well, thank you guys for sharing. Um, you know, there's a lot to unpack in each one of your stories, but one question that came to mind was, um, how ha what barriers have you experienced when, whether it was getting that procedure or getting, um, how did the process go when it came to getting your Omnipod and your Dexcom and then you as well with that biologic? I know that those processes can take a, a long time and you have to deal with the prior auths, rejections, reapplications, and just the, the mouse wheel of all of that. So if you can share what that was like. Sure, I'm glad you asked that because it's something I'm very passionate about. Um, so I first tried to get an insulin pump to control my diabetes about two years after I was diagnosed and my endocrinologist was very supportive. She understood that I wanted the one tubeless um, insulin pump, the Omnipod, which I now have. Uh, but this was back in 2016, going on to 2017. So things were a bit different then. Um, so she originally uh, you know, wrote a letter to my insurance asking if I could get the Omnipod. They said no. She submitted an appeal. They said no. She did something that I really appreciated, but maybe wasn't uh, <laughs> technically the, the right thing to do, but she said that I was in very active water sports and I would have to be disconnected from my pump if I got a tubed pump. This was not true, I barely swim. Um, but I really appreciated it because she was at this point desperate to get me the technology that I wanted that I would have to wear on my body 24 seven and this was the one that I wanted and she tried to make that happen. They still said no. I was placed on a different insulin pump with a tube. Um, I stayed with that for a few years. I really didn't like it. Um, 
but even just that point getting me to the pump that the one pump that my uh, my insurance company approved took six months. So this is six months of me taking insulin shots multiple times a day, not wanting to do it. I was in college, graduating college, turning 21, um, going traveling with my friends. It's not the time where you want to be pulling out your insulin pen, pen and giving shots. Um, so as a result, my diabetes really suffered. My A1C went up a lot in those six months. And part of that was just stress. It was so stressful. You know, every time that the insurance company shot down the appeal, I was really hurt. Like I cried many times during this process. And um, though eventually, uh, I think three years later, I was able to get the Omnipod pump that I wanted, it took three years, right? Um, and all of that was just because the insurance company decided that was what they wanted to cover, and this was something they didn't want to cover. And that has such intense emotional and physical effects on patients. So that's something that I still, still deal with today, even with getting the type of insulin that I like to use, that changes. I was on one type for many years, and then all of a sudden the insurance company said, we're actually not gonna cover that anymore, we're gonna switch you to this different brand. Um, and sometimes, you know, luckily for me, that insulin seems to work with my body, but for some people that's not the case. So insurance is a necessary evil, I think. Um, but it's, it's really something that if we're here to do the best for our patients, we should take a look at um, those kind of policies and see what is really going to be the best for them. So that's all I have to say. Um, I think I was very lucky in terms of access. I grew up in you know, Bellevue, Washington, near Seattle, which is a hot spot for biomed. There are great hospital systems there. Um, I was on really great health insurance because of my parents, and thankfully I, you know, I was diagnosed young, so I didn't have to worry about insurance. But um, it's, I, so I think I was very lucky in terms of my personal access. I, we didn't have to deal with a lot of insurance issues. The main barrier that I saw was something that I've been hearing from quite a few of the speakers today was just that initial, you know, not really believing that there was something deeper or more insidious at play here and that it was just, oh, you know, you need bifocals, like your vision is bad, you need bifocals. Um, but I, I'm gonna keep it short too because I feel like I, I wanna give room to, to y'all. Um, uveitis is one of the most common causes of preventable blindness across the globe. Um, I come from India, it's a huge issue in India, and one of the biggest reasons for that is poor screening. And thankfully, you know, I was able to go to an optometrist every year to get my eyes checked. Granted, you know, we weren't able to figure out what was going on after the screenings for some time. Um, but I at least had the access to see someone. Vision screening is something that a lot of people aren't really aware of. I talk to people all the time who haven't gotten their, adults who haven't gotten their eyes checked in years, so if you haven't gotten your eyes checked in a while, go get your eyes checked, it's important. Um, but it's something that, you know, a lot of people just don't know about and they don't know that it's something that's important that they should be doing. And if they do know it's important and they should be doing it, sometimes they just don't have the access. Um, ophthalmology procedures and medications and visits are expensive. They are so expensive. And I worked in um, clinical trials for uveitis patients for a while and we had a lot of people who came in that didn't have insurance, and they had to self-pay for, you know, visits that took half an hour and cost them 700 plus dollars, and that doesn't even include the medications or scans or anything like that. Um, so that's huge. I totally agree. We need to, you know, re-examine policies. Things just shouldn't cost that much, you know, like medicine has become more um, monetized, and that's just the direction the world is going, it seems, but it, it definitely poses a problem where, you know, money is posing a barrier to people's health because I do believe in equitable access when it comes to healthcare for everyone. And I think um, we just need to start looking at that a little bit more closely. Thank you. Yeah, I was also similarly lucky that I was diagnosed young, so I still have a few more years of my parents' insurance. Um, 
But I also was fortunate that I got my original colonoscopy in Illinois, and that doctor prescribed me um, mesalamine, which is like just a pill. Um, it's usually for people with like more um, moderate or mild uh, ulcerative colitis. Um, and then when I went to Boston, that doctor said, oh, well, she failed that drug because she's still sick, um, which that takes into step therapy where a lot of, um, with a lot of diseases, you have to fail a drug in order to get one that actually works. Um, so I ended up only actually taking that for a week. Um, so I was allowed to get the biologic covered by my insurance. Um, but um, yeah, when I was originally on Remicade, um, my insurance covered it right away, it was fine. But then after eight months, they were like, oh, well, we don't like your infusion center. Like, you can't go to the hospital that's right down the street from your house. You have to go somewhere 30 minutes away. And I was like, okay, that's fine. I have a car, it's fine. But then they were like, oh, well, we also don't like your brand of drug. So now you have to change that too. And it sounds simple, but it's like, will they even have the drug? You have to talk to the specialty pharmacy and make sure it gets sent to the right place. And um, luckily I was going every eight weeks at that point, so it wasn't too bad. Um, but then, um, as Michaela talked about, um, with this drug, you can develop antibodies. Um, and so there's a test for that. And the test, I think, costs like fifteen or $2,500. Um, and my doctor was like, for the first time, he was able to get it down to 75 after I got the $1,500 bill for a one, one tube of blood. Um, but then my last appointment with him before I moved, he's like, I want to check it again, but the um, company that runs this test they're not making it go to $75 anymore. So since you're doing fine right now, even though I'd like to check your blood level, I'm, we can't because you might get a bill for $2,000 and I don't want that to happen to you. So yeah, I think um, just access to healthcare, like even though I'm fortunate and I have insurance, there's still things like that that it just, you never know what bill you're gonna get. I mean, my medicine costs $7,000 every six weeks. Um, and there was a, like, luckily the drug company pays for it, but there was a while where I had like an outstanding $5,000 bill, um, and I just kept getting, um, cause the, um, uh, fee assistance plan and the, um, specialty pharmacy hadn't, um, reconciled the charge, but I just was like, I'm not going to pay that. I don't have that money. So <laughs> I just kept getting the bill, um, until it was fixed, but. Um, I think you guys bring up some, some good points about um, what equitable access to care looks like because you can, you know, be blessed in that you are given a prescription, but once that prescription leaves the iCloud or whatever and goes off into this mystery universe, the chances of you being able to get that drug, that biologic that is life-changing, so for example, I'm on uh, Enbrel, and if I wasn't on that, I don't know what my life would look like. The pain every day was, you know, mentally out of everything, so debilitating. And so um, I think that as future physicians, even if you had the, the privilege of being able to get access to it, um, I think that having that awareness of how difficult it is to get and knowing workarounds, like saying, you know, they're a water polo player and they've never been in a pool. Like, I think that that there are, it sounds crazy, but if it's the only way to help your patients, I think that, you know, it's unfortunately just a part of the game that you have to play. Um, one of the other questions that I had was, a kind of funny thing about being a med student is you have to learn about all of the different diseases, right? And so you have to learn about, um, for example, why it happens or different theories as to why things happen, um, different ways that they approach medicine and, you know, theories for biologics and how they would work and prevent the progression of a disease or even cure it. Um, I think that that can be really hard to sit there and read a textbook and hear from your professors about all of the things that you that can go wrong and then over the course of your life you can experience and then you have to translate that to your patients so you have to know this in order to educate your patients and keep them as healthy as possible but how as med students who have to then share that information how do you 
read about, I could, for example, diabetes, I could go blind, have neuropathy, and then all the complications of um, inflammatory bowel disease, and then even your eye condition if it came back. How do you guys like reconcile being able to deal with that personally, but then also translate that to your patients? Yeah, so all three of us just started medical school in July, so um, I'm lucky enough to be able to answer this question because in our first major block class, we did talk about type 1 diabetes briefly um, in the autoimmune section of our course. And when we got to that section, it was um, very quick. I know we're going to go into more detail in the second year, uh, which I'm looking forward to. But in that brief overview, I felt a lot of generalizations. And this was because we don't have enough time. We don't have the capabilities to memorize every single thing about this extremely complicated disease that the experts don't even know a lot about at this point um, in, in this class where we're also learning tons of other things. But I, when I was sitting in that lecture, I really wanted to get up there and ask the professor, like, hey, can I talk about this a little bit? Um, I didn't because, again, we don't have time to listen to all of that. But if anything, it made me more reassured with the path that I've taken. I thought I knew why I wanted to be a doctor when I started college, but I really didn't until I was diagnosed with diabetes. And that experience as a patient is what really led to my passion to be, to be a physician. And that's what keeps me going today. And so I know that as part of this, we're going to have to sit through some difficult things. And to me, it's, it's really worth it, even though it's not the type of overview I would have wanted to give or not the type of things I would have wanted to highlight. I think just the fact that someone's talking about it is really important. Um, something else that I would like to see included in our curriculum, even if it's just talks like this, is including the patient perspective for some of these. And we do have patient seminars every now and again where they, they can come and talk about their diagnoses. And I think that really makes a difference in creating that kind of kind physician, that empathy that is so necessary, maybe one of the most important things in being a doctor. Um, we haven't started talking about the I in school yet, <laughs> and I'm very excited about that. Um, and I hope they talk about uveitis, because I love talking about uveitis. Um, but I... Oh, yes. Okay, great. Um, and I'm excited to hear about that, and I am kind of curious to see how it's how it's going to be explained because, you know, when you're, you know, when I'm a patient and I'm sitting in the clinic having a condition explained to me, they're not necessarily talking about, you know, um, <laughs> the cascade of proteins that leads to my condition. You know, I was 12. I don't know what a protein is. Um, but it's, it's interesting that I feel like learning about some of these other conditions that we've learned about in our, you know, three months of med school so far, um, it's easy to feel like you, you know, you read it, you watch a video, you're like, oh, I know what's going on. Like, I have an understanding of this. And then you talk to someone who has the condition, and there are all of these factors that you haven't considered at all. Um, and I think that's, that's the key, right? Like, being able to listen to patients in the panels that we have as part of our curriculum or interact with people at some of the clinics where you can volunteer as a medical student to actually learn what it looks like on the other side. Because as we've heard today, everyone's experience, there are common traits, but there are a lot of nuanced differences too. And that's what makes, I think that's what makes a good doctor. Like you have to be able to cater to the person sitting in front of you, you know, like avoiding generalizations, avoiding treating everyone like a disease and rather looking, you know, at them as a person with a condition that you're trying to help them through and not the disease itself. Um, so yeah, I'm excited to talk about uveitis and I hope that I get to meet more people with the condition so I can learn more about it because my own experience is my own, but the people that I got to work with at the clinic that I was at for a few years, tons of them, I mean, most of them had worse disease than I did and that was really eye-opening. Um, statistically, I was told that I was never going to meet another uveitis patient in my lifetime, and I'm very grateful to have met like 300 since I worked at that clinic for a couple years. Um, and I, kind of, I wish that we could just meet 
everyone who has a condition that we're learning about in school, because I think that's where you learn like the heart of the, the content, because understanding the concept is one thing, understanding what it looks like and how it affects a person is a totally different thing. I think one thing I realized is you really never know who you're in a room with. Like for me, I like to think that you can't really tell I have ulcerative colitis, and I think that's true for a lot of people with a lot of conditions. Um, and I remember, our, I think it was our second, we have this case-based instruction, and it was a breast cancer case, but one of the siblings had ulcerative colitis. And I was like, of course, there it is, week two of med school. And one of my classmates was like, oh yeah, that brother has colon cancer, and I was like, I thank you for the reminder that I'm at a high risk for colon cancer, but um, <laughs> it is in fact not colon cancer. Um, and yeah, I think it's interesting because I've told some of my classmates, but it's not something that I just like broadcast everywhere. But when it does get brought up, I'm, it's interesting to hear other people's views. And sometimes, like I've told classmates that I have it, and they're like, oh, I'm so sorry. And I'm like, I appreciate that, but this is my life. So. Um, I think that happens with multiple conditions, like, if, I knew Nina had uveitis because she told me, but um, <laughs> when we get there, a lot of people probably won't, and they'll be like, oh, there's all these horrible side effects, but it's just our lives, so I think kind of keeping that in mind, at least for myself as well, um, is really big because you really just never know um, what someone else is going through. Uh, just to add one thing that I just thought of, um, terminology is really important. So in medical school, we, or just in the general zeitgeist, we refer to uh, if you have diabetes, you are a diabetic, um, as opposed to a person with diabetes. We don't say, we say like a person with cancer, right? That small difference is really important to people who live with these chronic conditions because you're putting the person first and not the disease. So that's also something that I would like to see improved upon in general. So we are about out of time, but we could talk about this all day long or all week or all year, depending on the, how we're feeling that day. Um, but I think one thing to just wrap it up is that um, U of A has done a lot to put patients at the center of care, and I think every single year there are new projects that are coming out that are talking about um, why we do what we do, which is to help patients, and even Cami. It was funny, when the first time I heard about it, I remember telling my mom, I came up with that idea first when I was like six, you know? <laughs> like the impact of um, molecular therapies in um, how important the immune system is to every single disease that we learn about, talk about, and that all of you may have come across in your lifetime. Um, and I think that that's an important and significant you know, part of this medical school experience. And then all of the experience that we can then provide to um, you know, programs like CAMI, and then even in our doctoring program, we all have unique perspectives because we've been there, um, not including family members who have also had conditions. And so I think that um, having panels like this and including the medical student community is a way to, you know, forge a way forward where there's innovation and then also progression to, um, I guess, start righting some of the wrongs of the past when it comes to how we approach patients. So thank you for having us.